Welcome and thank you for being here. I'm Kimberly Hokanson, Director of Annual Membership Programs and Operations at the MFA. We appreciate your support of the museum and your participation in the MFA's virtual member lecture series. This program is coming to you virtually from the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. Founded in 1870, the MFA stands on a site which has long served as a place of meeting and exchange among different Algonquin nations, including the Massachusetts. As a museum, we acknowledge the long histories of the land we occupy today and seek ways to make indigenous narratives more prominent in our galleries and programming. Before I introduce our speaker, a few logistical notes. A transcript and closed captions are available during this program. To enable closed captions, go to the bottom of the Zoom window and click on Show Captions. During the presentation, you may use Zoom's Q&A function to ask questions and share comments. Please note, this lecture is being recorded and will be available in the next month on the MFA's YouTube channel. And now I am pleased to introduce tonight's speaker. Noni Gadsen is the Catherine Lane Weems Senior Curator of American Decorative Arts and Sculpture at the MFA. She joined the MFA in 2004 and was a key member of the team that planned and installed the MFA's Art of the Americas wing. She heads the Collections Committee of the Nichols House Museum on Boston's Beacon Hill, serves as a governor for the Decorative Arts Trust, and is a member of the Council of the Colonial Society of Massachusetts. In addition to numerous articles, essays, and book reviews, Noni is the author of a number of books, including her latest, America Goes Modern, The Rise of the Industrial Designer. Noni, thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks so much, Kimberly, for that kind introduction and good evening, everyone. I am delighted to be with you virtually this evening to speak about the exhibition Toshiko Takiezu. Okay, just getting myself situated. Toshiko Takiezu Shaping Abstraction, which is now on view on the third floor of the MFA's Art of the Americas Wing. So let's jump in. Toshiko Takiezu may be the most important American abstract artist that you've never heard of. It's time for that to change. Takiezu was a technica, technically masterful and innovative artist best known for her sculptural ceramics, which she called closed forms, such as those you see surrounding her in this image. She made these rounded shapes in a range of sizes and profiles with only a nipple-like opening at the top, to allow the gases to escape during firing. Her closed forms eloquently merged this soft shape with her gestural glazing style in which colors were brushed, poured, dripped, or splashed onto the surface. In essence, Takiezu ceramics are abstract paintings in the round. Takiezu was a key figure in the reconceptualization of ceramics in the 1950s shifting ideas from the functional craft tradition to the realm of fine art. She continued to develop the signature style of closed forms, experimenting with shapes, glazes, and even scale for over five decades. It is lesser known, however, that Takiezu was equally talented in weaving, painting, and bronze casting. She also had a lasting influence on legions of emerging artists through her many years of teaching. My colleagues and I feel Takiezu has been underrecognized for her contributions, largely due to her gender, race, and primary medium of ceramics, but also because she did not court the art market, instead focusing on making and teaching. This exhibition argues that Takiezu's cross-cultural and multidisciplinary practice makes her one of the most compelling American abstract artists of the 20th century. She challenged narrow definitions of American abstraction, pushing it out of the traditional frame or canvas into three dimensions. But to understand Takiezu's art, you must learn a little bit more about Takiezu herself. 
In the past, scholars and critics have essentialized Takiezu, describing her in black and white terms of East meets West. Yet that is a gross simplification of a very complex woman who developed a deeply integrated, holistic approach to her art and her everyday life. As we shall see, Takiezu drew upon all aspects of her background and life experiences for inspiration. So who was Toshiko Takiezu? Takiezu was born in Hawaii in 1922 to immigrant parents from Okinawa. She was the sixth of 11 children. They lived and worked as sugarcane laborers during her youth, part of the large expatriate Japanese community in Hawaii. The strained relationship between Okinawan and Japanese immigrants in Hawaii helped to shape Toshiko's early years. I had not been aware of this historical context, so I'll share a little of that with you now. Okinawa, the southernmost island in Japan, all the way down, if you can see my cursor here towards the bottom, was ruled by the indigenous Ryukyu Kingdom for centuries until it was forcibly annexed by Japan in 1879. The Japanese government insisted that Okinawans stop using their indigenous language and stop following their distinctive cultural practices so that they would assimilate within the Japanese culture. This naturally led to discrimination against Okinawans, which continued within the Okinawan and Japanese communities in Hawaii. As a result, Toshiko's parents decided to raise their children as Japanese. They spoke the ok Okinawan language to each other, but only spoke Japanese to the children. They celebrated Japanese festivals and traditions. This was Toshiko's parents' way of helping their children not be discriminated against by Japanese immigrants. But that did not stop the family from facing discrimination from others in the hybrid Hawaiian community, particularly during and after World War II. People of Japanese ancestry were not forced into internment camps like their counterparts on the mainland West Coast, but there was certainly a heightened sense of scrutiny. I share all of this with, to show you that issues of identity and questions uh, about identity were present and pressing throughout Takiezu's life, whether she consciously acknowledged them or not. But from the start, Toshiko forged her own path. Her parents gave each child a Japanese name and an American name. Of all 11 children, only Toshiko chose to use her Japanese name. As a teenager, she dropped out of high school against her mother's wishes to help support the family. She was introduced to clay through a chance opportunity to work for the Hawaiian Potter's Guild. She instantly fell in love with the medium and started to experiment on her own. With the encouragement of others, she developed strong technical skills at the guild and started to teach at a local grade school and at YWCA's, as you can see here. In 1948, she enrolled in the University of Hawaii at Manoa to study ceramics with Claude Haran, seen here on the left, and even mounted her first exhibition in the Library of Hawaii at Honolulu with about 50 pots and three sculptural busts. Then in 1951, at the age of 29, Toshiko boldly left her family and the islands to study further at the renowned Cranbrook Academy of Art in Michigan. She wanted to train under this woman, Maya Gratel, a Finnish immigrant who was the head of the ceramics at Cranbrook and whose work she had admired in magazines. Grotel had an enormous influence on Takiezu both in rigorous work ethic, insatiable curiosity to experiment, and most importantly, her encouragement or her really her insistence that Toshiko find her own voice. At Cranbrook, Takiezu experimented with forms and modes of decoration, slowly, slowly starting to find her own style. While at Cranbrook, Takiezu minored in weaving studying with another Finnish immigrant, Marianne Strangel, who you see here, who introduced her to the Scandinavian tradition of raya rugs, a shaggy hand-knotted wool rug, as you see in the work on the right. 
Takeizu would continue to explore this style of weaving for over 20 years. Another major influence on Takeizu was her eight month trip to Japan in 1955 to 56. She joined her mother and sister Miriam on a trip to Japan and Okinawa, thinking it would be a good opportunity to learn more about her own heritage and to gain a stronger understanding of the famous Japanese ceramics. After a two week group tour of Japan, which you see the group here on the left, the three women flew to Okinawa to visit family. Takiezu visited her first potteries in the Saboya district of Okinawa in the main city of Naha. She was warmly welcomed by Isibara Arakaki and Kinjo Jiro, two of the leading potters of the region. They gave her a tour of their workshops and even invited her to make some pots. As she recalled of the experience, all the eyes watched me because women potters were unheard of in Japan. Toshiko also attended the kiln opening of a traditional climbing kiln where the kiln is set into a hill and the firing progresses steadily up through the multiple chambers over several days. Here you see her on the left as the kiln workers and potters were unloading works. In early November, the three women flew back to mainland Japan where Toshiko's mother returned to Hawaii and Toshiko and Miriam set out for Tokyo. They plan to travel throughout Japan to meet and observe more Japanese potters. I've written a detailed account of this eight month trip with my MFA colleague, Ai Fukunaga, the MFA's former Ishibashi Foundation Assistant Curator of Japanese Art. Our essay, which recreates Toshiko's time in Japan and identifies the potters that she encountered, will be published this spring in a new monograph coming out about Takiezu. We discovered that Takiezu visited a wide range of potters, some who revived historic styles, others who were followers of the Minge or folk art movement, and still others who were pioneering the new Japanese avant-garde approach to sculptural ceramics. Towards the end of her trip, Takiezu spent three days working in the studio of Kanashige Toyo, who made traditional unglazed Bizen style pots, such as you see here in pictures taken by Takiezu. The elder Japanese craftsman made a strong influence on her, not necessarily on technique or style, but in his working methods. Takiezu gained an appreciation for the Japanese approach of merging art and life, a practice that she developed and followed for the rest of her career. The image on the left shows eight of the pots that Takiezu made during her time in Kanashige's workshop. A friend sent her this image after the works were fired as she had already returned to the United States. As you can see, the forms include some traditional tea bowls, but also a new form that she had just started to explore, the two spouted pots in the back. Upon her return in 1956, Takiezu took a position teaching ceramics at the Cleveland Institute of Art. She continued to experiment with exaggerated extended necks or handles such as the works you see here. And her brushstrokes were getting looser and more animated. It was in Cleveland in 1958 that Toshiko developed her signature style, the closed form with which we started. From here, she delved into glaze formulation and use, creating depth and layers to her captivating glazes, such as the examples that you see here. I am now gonna shift my presentation to share a little bit more about Takiezu through the MFA's exhibition to give you some insight behind the scenes. Here you see the opening wall that greets you upon entering with Takiezu sitting among her pots. To help me shape our exhibition narratives, I worked with a large group of advisors, both inside and out of the MFA. At the MFA, I worked closely, not only with Ai Fugnaga, who I mentioned earlier, but also with Jennifer Swope, the MFA's Logi Curator of Textiles, and Jacqueline Yu, the MFA Pathways Summer Intern, who was about to finish up her final year at Columbia University, as well as numerous colleagues in interpretation, design, programs, and more. We also created this exhibition in collaboration with the Azamu Noguchi Foundation and Garden Museum in Long Island City, New York. 
The Noguchi Museum is organizing a large scale retrospective exhibition on Toshiko called Toshiko Takiezu, Worlds Within, which opens next month. And they spearheaded the publication of the new monograph I mentioned earlier, which will be released at the same time. Both the Noguchi's exhibition and ours would not have been possible without the support of the Takiezu Studio, which is still running as a nonprofit with an artist in residence program in Quakertown, New Jersey, and the Toshiko Takiezu Foundation, whose mission is to preserve and promote the artistic legacy of Takiezu. Last but certainly not least, I was advised by a community group called Table of Voices. Founded in 2019, Table of Voices is a program that actively collaborates with museum community or with Boston music community members to offer more expansive and accessible interpretations of work presented at the MFA. This program recognizes that museum staff members do not represent all perspectives. Instead, we bring together community members who are experts in their own fields, whose perspective we think could help us better understand how to present the exhibition. Here you see the eight community members who participated in our table of voices, which include Darlene Fukuji, the president of the Toshiko Takezu Foundation and a great niece of Toshiko's, as well as Ben Eberly, a former apprentice of Toshiko's, as well as two artists, a weaver, and even a native Hawaiian student who, like Takiezu, left the islands to come to school at Northeastern in Boston. The Table of Voices cohort met three times to learn about Takiezu, to discuss what about her story resonated with them, and how to present this story in the gallery. You will see their influence in nearly every part of the exhibition. They encouraged us to make Takiezu herself very visible through images, such as the front wall, and through the video you see here on the right. Additionally, we included her voice by posting quotations throughout the show. They also held us accountable for truly talking about Toshiko's complex identity, as this was such an important part of her life and her art, an important aspect of her story to many of those in the table of voices. We invited two of the artist's relatives to craft this label titled Toshiko Takiezu, born in Hawaii and of Okinawan heritage. In addition, the Table of Voice, Voices cohort helped me to narrow down the six major themes to explore in the show. Multimedia practices, immersive display style, merging art and life, the trip to Japan, sound, and the mentoring and legacy. For the rest, my rest of my time this evening, I will focus on three of those themes the multimedia practices, the experiments with sound, and immersive display. I spoke about this some at the beginning, but I haven't shared much about the work Toshiko did in other media other than ceramics. What I learned is that you really cannot separate the different media out. One of the most fascinating elements of Toshiko's work to me is that she took techniques from one discipline and applied them to others. All of her different endeavors were connected and none would have existed without the influence of the others. Whether sculpting in clay or bronze, painting or weaving, Takiezu deeply considered the intersections of color, texture, form and movement. Her knowledge of each of these media allowed her to make some of her best work in which she expanded the boundaries of abstraction into three dimensions. So first, painting. The painted decoration or glazes that Takezu applied to her pot's surface were just as important to her as the form. She strove to merge form and surface decoration so they complemented and enhanced each other. Once she created the closed form, Takezu began to investigate uh, glazing techniques and color with more rigor. Her palette became increasingly stronger and more varied as did her methods. While early on, she primarily applied glaze with a brush, as you see here, she started to dip, pour, splash, and even spray her colors onto the clay, often lifting the pot to change the direction of the flowing glaze. Takiezu likened glazing to dancing. As for her, 
It was a full body experience. This gestural style aligns with the practices of the action painters or abstract expressionists who were her contemporaries. Yet unlike abstract expressionists working on canvas, Takiezu had an added complication. She was, in essence, painting in the dark. Since glazes do not reveal their final colors until fired in the kiln, Takiezu could only imagine the hues and the compositions that she was working on. It was not until after the work was completed that she would finally see the results. She embraced this delay in the process, which made an added element of chance, anticipation, and discovery with every piece. Takiezu often hung her round and square plates on the wall, emphasizing their relationship to paintings. Early on, she even gave the plates dark rims that looked like frames, as seen in the two examples here on the far right. But later she allowed the glazes to flow over the edges onto the back of the plate, transcending the boundaries. But Takiezu also did not confine her paintings to ceramics. From 1969 to 1973, she experimented with abstract painting on canvas. Most of these works, like painting B seen here, were made during her visits to Hawaii, where she did not have a kiln. Her canvases often reflect the vibrant and awe-inspiring landscapes of her homeland. The bands of intense color in painting B suggest a horizon line with land, sea, and sky. The combination of these hues in Takiezu's paintings often correlated with her glazed ceramics and textiles. Takiezu energetically splashed, poured, and dripped paint across the canvas in sweeping, rapid mo movement. When making Mirasaki, which means purple in Japanese, the artist treated the canvas as if it were a pot. She rotated the canvas 90 degrees repeatedly, resulting in the intriguing sideways drips in the upper section. Like her glazes on ceramics, the numerous layers of paint offer a strong sense of depth, even on a two-dimensional surface. Takiezu experimented with textiles and weaving from a young age. She remembers women in her family using whatever materials they had available to create fabric, including banana fibers and other local materials. She learned the technique called raya in Swedish, called raya in Swedish, which means rough and shaggy, at Cranbrook from Finnish-born Marianne Strangel. While Scandinavian raya rugs were usually woven from wool and linen, Takiezu mixed natural and synthetic fibers using strong nylon threads for the warps. For the pile wefts that predominate the surface of her work, she looped thick wool threads and knotted them in place. Sometimes she kept the loop, but other times, like for this work, she cut the loops to get these shaggy ends. In many of these works, like Magic Circle of 1970 seen here, she blended a thin silk and, and rayon threads with the thicker wool for subtle color and texture variation. The sense of movement given by these combined textures and subtle gradations of color offers a noticeably painterly quality to the weaving. Note also that she is often working in undulating bands of color, much like her paintings. The MFA is very proud to have acquired two of Takiezu's weaving in preparation for this exhibition, including this masterpiece titled Ow Ow, made in 1970. This is another time where the table of voices helped out. I asked the Northeastern student, Tia Midro, to write a label explaining the meaning of the word of the Hawaiian title, Ow Ow. And this is what she wrote. In Hawaiian language, Ow Ow can be interpreted as the side of a thing, as land or country or the coast of a country. Yet it could also describe a way, habit, manner, a course of life. Takiezu skillfully weaves these themes together, illustrating how the spiritual essence of Hawaii, her homeland, is profoundly intertwined with the natural environment in intricate layers. For the people of Hawaii, our identity is rooted in this sacred bond and deep reverence for the land 
recognizing that all realms of the world are interwoven into a cohesive fabric. I love that. Interestingly, we learned that a single ao rather than ao ao, a single ao in Japanese means blue. So we think Takiezu may have been emphasizing her own hybrid identity by doing a play on words in different languages. In 1980s and 1990s, Takiezu was invited to experiment in bronze. She worked in collaboration with a skilled craftsman at Johnson Atelier near her home in New Jersey. In this process, Takiezu would create a wax model, sometimes cast from her ceramics, sometimes directly sculpted, that would then be used to create a mold for a bronze cast. At first, she created relatively small river stones, which she then stacked to make a tall bronze totem, such as that which you see here in her courtyard of her studio. She also created bronze bells inspired by Japanese temple bells. She started to work on larger scale and was excited by the ability to have these works reside outside. There's a close relationship between her bronze sculptures and her work in clay. And again, she brought lessons from one medium to another. Here you see one of her bronze moons on the left in which she managed to capture the spontaneity of glazing in a medium known for its solidity. To achieve this, she created the wax mold, but then poured and dripped molten wax on top of the mold as assistants turned it, creating in relief the gestures of her glazes. Sound. Takiezu happened upon one of her most radical artistic innovations by chance. After she accidentally dropped a piece of the pot's rim into a vessel, the bit of clay happened to stay separate during the firing process, producing a rattle inside the finished pot. Intrigued by the effect, Takiezu began purposefully dropping balls of clay into her closed forms, experimenting with the amount and the size to produce different sounds. When speaking about her closed forms, the artist once commented that, quote, the most important part about this piece is the dark space that you can't see. These rattles, I like to think, help give voice to that dark space inside, calling it to our attention. Takiezu further explored sound in her bronze bells, which were modeled after those found in Japanese temples. Her bells did not have the traditional clapper inside to make sound, but were played by striking the exterior with a mallet or stick, as you can see her doing here. We recorded some of these sounds and play, play them in the gallery to give visitors some of the multi-sensory experience that Takiezu envisioned. The last theme that I will discuss this evening is Takiezu's experiments with display. Takiezu always carefully considered the display of her work. Early in her career, she arranged the pottery in seemingly informal yet rhythmic formations on low platforms. Here you see her standing in an exhibition of this style from 1967 in Honolulu. She used her weavings as grounds or backdrops for her ceramics and included house plants and furniture to suggest the ambiance of a domestic interior. In the 1970s, Takiezu began to experiment more deliberately with her installation strategies, exploring the relationship of her works to one another, to their environment, and to the viewer. These immersive displays often alluded to nature or landscapes. For example, she embedded groups of her near spherical moons, such as you see here, in small, and as well as smaller closed forms in gravel, small rocks, or sand to evoke a dry riverbed. In the 1970s, Takiezu started making tall cylindrical forms she called trees. These were inspired by Hawaii's so-called devastation forest, a landscape on the big island that was created when the volcano erupted in 1959. As the lava seeped down the mountainside, it destroyed all in its path, leaving only a few stark tree trunks with no branches. Takiezu combined her tall cylindrical vessels modeled after trees into tight formations 
suggesting a forest. She did this outdoor installation at the Hilo International Airport in Hawaii in 1979. But she kept experimenting with the forms and their arrangements. Here's another installation of her trees, this one indoors at the Tang Teaching Museum at Skidmore College in 1994. And as her work became larger, Takiezu's exhibitions became even more interactive. Her star series, which is composed of 14 monumental closed forms, invites viewers to walk through and around the works, finding their own unique pathway. Here you see Takiezu walking among these works on a farm near her home. For our installation at the MFA, we tried to take inspiration from Takiezu's display style. The front of the fabulous curved platform on the right starts with a dry riverbed, like Takiezu displayed in, her, in 1979, as you see here. Her moons are nestled in and among smaller moons and flatter, flatter river stones to evoke a natural landscape or dry riverbed. Here is a closer view of the MFA's platform that I have stitched together the photos. Further down the platform, you encounter examples of Takiezu's trees, as if you were coming up upon a riverbank. And finally, at the far end, there are round platforms containing groups of color which I playfully call my garden beds. As you can imagine, we had to balance the safety of the artworks with the openness of the display. And I feel that we struck the right balance. To sum up, one of the many things I learned while working on this project was that Toshiko Takiezu was ahead of her time. So many innovative aspects of her practice have now become so commonplace, we don't even recognize how innovative they were. Nowadays, many artists work in different media, but that was far less common in the mid 20th century. Today, many artists incorporate sound into their art, but that was simply radical when Takeizu started to do it in the 1960s. And now everywhere we go, we encounter immersive display styles some that are all about the experience and not the art. But when Takiezu started to think this way in the 1970s, she was on the forefront of that movement. I like to think that the art world is finally catching up to Toshiko Takiezu. Thank you. Thank you so much, Noni, that was wonderful. We already have some questions for you, so we, we do have some time and uh, I'll start now. Carolyn is wondering, um, uh, she noticed that some of the works in the MFA were donated by the artist. Did she have a relationship with the museum? Great question. Thank you for that, Carolyn. Um, late in her life, Toshiko Takiezu researched with help of her apprentices which institutions had interest in her work. And by that already had an example of their, her work in their collection. And then she reached out to them, something like 16 or so institutions and offered them gifts of, of her work. Basically placing her artwork in places that she already knew had interest and in essence, creating her own legacy. It was a very wise and interesting thing to do. And that was in 2007. That, we, that the MFA accepted those works. And there are a lot of Toshiko Takiezu exhibitions happening right now. It's taken us a, a, over a decade to finally sort of catch up and recognize what wonderful things she put into our collections and made available to us. Great, thank you. Um, Gretchen has been to the exhibit and she didn't notice any information about the glazes used nor how the ceramics were fired. Um, electric, gas kilns, open pit firing, wood fired. Um, do you have any information to share? Sure, um, and I, if somebody else knows better than me on this, because I know that there are people watching who know better than me, I believe Dakiezu had an electric kiln, in, at least in her home in Quakertown, New Jersey, she had an electric kiln that she, um, that she fired, but she also worked 
on in wood firing and Raku and other uh, ways when she went to visit other places or um, did a lot of workshops or so forth. Um, her glazes are, you know, above my head. The, the amount of experiment experimentation she did in her in the uh, different combination of chemicals and minerals and so forth. So you're right. I did not go as deeply into that. Um, and I am still trying to understand it more deeply myself. Um, but she she was a true master. And um, the people who can speak best to that are the people who were her assistants. Um, she had 40 people who served as apprentices for her from one person per year lived with her and did all and helped her with her work from 1970 and through 2010, the year before she died. And those are the people who can speak best to, to that information. Great, thank you. Um, a nice compliment from Christine. Wow, amazing presentation. And she is looking forward to seeing the exhibition in person. Um, Carolyn wonders, um, how did she keep the round forms from rolling away? Is that ever a problem for the exhibitions? Oh, you betcha. Um, that was something we definitely got concerned about. Um, so there is on most of the round forms, not all, but most of the round forms, there's a bit of a flat surface um, that, that the piece sits in. But some there do not. Um, and we had to get a little creative with how we made sure to secure the works. Um, if you come to the exhibition, you will see that the totally round forms do have little feet, cradles that they sit in um, to make sure that they don't go wandering away. Um, you know, we had to be thinking of both security as well as in case somebody got up on the platform, please don't get up on the platform. And, you know, or we, we had to make sure that we were um, taking care of the works. So it, it's always an interesting idea when you're showing something in the rounds like we are doing without bonnets um, to be able to secure them properly. So we have amazing colleagues at the MFA who come up with the most beautiful solutions to some of these um, complex issues that we that we face. Great. Deborah's wondering whether or not you can talk a little bit more about her relationship with her apprentices. Sure. Well, um, I can tell you a, some a little bit from what I, they have told me. And um, the, these are a very special group of people. They are all completely and utterly devoted to her and her legacy. Um, that's been what struck, has struck me the most. Um, if you got close to Toshiko, you are you are forever feel uh, forever in her debt and feel forever love, lucky to have had that opportunity. The apprentices, it was a more traditional style apprentice system where they lived with her. I think most of the time living in a unheated uh, top of the above the barn. Um, and you got up in the morning and you swept and you helped garden and weed the, the garden and um, you helped her with her work. You drove her around. And of course, the apprentice's experience changed over the course of the 40 years. Um, there were some who were there in the 70s and the 80s had a very different experience than those that, who were there in the 2000s when she was in her 80s. Um, but each one seemed to take something really special from that that from that process and they tell really good stories. <laughs> That's great. Uh, Winifred is offering some more information about the glazes. She said they were high fire stoneware glazes. She fired a great deal in gas fired kilns, both oxidation and reduction. That uh, is very true. Thank you for helping me with that. Simone um, said, you mentioned that there were that there are so many exhibits right now. Why do you think that is? And why has her art been dormant for such a long time? That's a real, that's a good question. And I've been asked that a fair amount. I think there are another several reasons that are coming together um, right now for why I call this, we're having a Takiezu moment. For example, she was shown in the um, Venice Biennale in 2022. Um, our show opened last fall. A week later, one opened at Crystal Bridges in, um, in Arkansas. The Noguchi's major retrospective opens next month in, in March, March 21st in um, Long Island City, New York. And that will travel to four different venues around the country. Um, all of these things are happening for several reasons. One, Takiezu planted the seeds, 
long ago for people for uh, institutions to have these core collections to work from. Her papers were and her archives were digitized by the Smithsonian Archive of American Art in 2020, making it much more accessible to researchers. Her foundation was established in 2015, working to promote her legacy. And it we finally got to the point where we recognized her brilliance. Um, and as I said, I think the, the art world is finally catching up to her. So those would be the reasons why I think that it's, it's happening right now. Great. Jude is wondering about some of the big pieces. Um, where, were, where were they fired and yeah. were they made in more than one piece? So these are great. Um, they were primarily fired at the, in Skidmore College where they had a large, huge kiln and she would she developed a strong relationship with the folks in Skidmore uh, because she would use their kiln and she would teach workshops up there and um, they from what I understand um, from the folks who helped her with some of these pots she would start a pot on a wheel to the extent of her arm length and then would light a fire inside to harden it but just enough not fully hard but to harden it to give it strength and then they roll out really long coils of, of clay, like six feet long, and walk over as a team and slowly coil them up. And then Toshika would stand on a stool and the wheel would be turned and she would she would pull up the sides. And that process, and then they would, once they felt that that was, and there was an apprentice doing it on the other side as well, sort of working in harmony, um, it was sort of a dance working together. And then they would hard it, they would again heat to harden that so it was strong enough to take the next layer. And they proceeded like that um, all the way up through the top of the piece to the point where, if you think about it, 82 year old Toshiko Takeizu was standing probably six feet above the ground on some scaffolding trying to like pull this up. It's a, it took a huge amount of coordination and teamwork among the people who, who work there. Uh, and worked with her, but also a lot of trust. Um, and I, I think they're they're truly um, fast, fantastic to see these these enormous pieces. Great. Uh, Moira is so interested to hear how her Hawaiian and Japanese heritages influenced her work. Do you feel that gender played an equal part? Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. She was um, there. Were, the people who were getting the most attention in ceramics at this time were the men and still are the men. Peter Volkus is the name that uh, most people are more familiar with um, for working in uh, sculptural ceramics and the move to sculptural ceramics. Takeizu was right there along at the same time. She did not court the art markets, um, nor did she, what, did she have a lot of bravado. Um, she let people come to her and to appreciate her. She put so much into her teaching um, she knew she was doing something special and somehow she knew that people would finally catch up. Um, so I think one of the amazing things is that she did things her way, um, despite all the different pressures on her, whether they be gender-based or race-based or so forth, she found her own way and she lived her life that way. And, um, now we are starting to understand that more. Great. Well, we have time for a couple more questions. Susan um, greatly admires painting B and wondered if it's possible to obtain a high quality print of it. I'm afraid not, Susan, I'm so sorry. Um, that is privately owned. And um, that is all the paintings primarily were given as gifts by Toshiko to family members or other friends. And that has descended in the family of one of her friends. And uh, so we are very lucky to have it on loan. Thank you very much, um, but uh, we we cannot give offer um, images of it. Great. Tess is curious if she encountered Harry Batoya at Cranbrook and his sound sculptures. I'm trying to think of the timing. The the, the sculpture teacher at Cranbrook when she was there um, was uh, Bill McVeigh, another uh, uh, abstract sculptor. And his wife, Lisa McVeigh, who was another ceramicist, abstract, uh, abstract ceramicist, sculptural ceramicist, uh, was there, overlapped with Toshiko during some of her time there. 
I do not believe she overlapped with Harry Botoyo, who I think was earlier in the late 40s, but I'm sure somebody can correct me if that is incorrect. Wait, but the so sound part is, uh, is I agree that that I hadn't made that connection, Botoya being there with the sound, that that's an interesting um, note to make. So one last question. Um, first of all, this is so amazing and thank you so much for this. I would love to know more about her teaching. Could you share more? Did she do classroom teaching as well as her apprenticeships? Yes, yes. Um, so she started this, she started, well, she started teaching at YWCA's and grade schools in Hawaii. Um, she taught for first year out of Cranbrook. She taught for a year at the University of Wisconsin in uh, Madison. She was basically, while well, Harvey Littleton, who was doing ceramics at the time, you might know him as a glass blower, but he was doing ceramics at the time, was took a sabbatical and she taught in his place for a year. She went to Japan, came back, taught at Cleveland for 10 years, classroom teaching, two students. Um, very, she was very much um, a encouraging experimentation, encouraging her students to find their own voice, um, not a lot, doing a lot of demonstration, not doing a lot of step-by-step -step instruction. Um, and then after 10 years in Cleveland, she moved to um, New Jersey and pretty soon Princeton came knocking on the door and asked her, they were starting a visual um, arts course and asked her if she would teach. And she ended up teaching there for 30 years. Um, and slews and slews of students um, came through her, her, um, her studio. Um, in addition to all of those, she had her 40 apprentices over one a year for over years. And she did numerous workshops, summer workshops at Skidmore, at Swarthmore, at all sorts of different places, Penland and um, out west. And I can't remember, sorry, Don, I can't remember the name of the place out in um, the West Coast. But uh, she, she, did an, she gave an enormous amount of energy to her teaching. That's great. Well, Noni, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This was great. And um, for all of you, who joined us, thank you for being here. And again, thank you for your support of the MFA and we hope you'll have a good evening. Thanks so much. Thank good night. You.